Welcome everybody here on, uh, in, in Lawson Mill. Welcome, which camera am I looking at, William? Oh, welcome those people who might be joining us on Zoom. Nigel is here to give us a talk about the John Valley Landscape Group, which is brilliant because as a, a Canal Trust, we've, we've been always interested in the, in the navigation, its surroundings. In fact, our charitable document requires us to have an interest in the surroundings and navigation, so it's particularly relevant. Um, so Nigel, thank you for being here again. Okay. Over to you. Well, good evening to you all. Um, my talk this evening will be in two parts. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about the Chama Valley Landscape Group itself, and then I'm going to talk, uh, give you a brief overview of the uh, historic landscape of the Chama Valley, uh, some of which will no doubt be familiar to you. Hopefully other parts will be uh, fresh and maybe give you a better idea of the uh, wider historical setting of the uh, Chama Blackwater navigation. Uh, the Chama Valley's considerable uh, landscape interest, uh, great natural um, interest and considerable historical and archaeological interest. Um, as these landscape views so, uh, in many ways it's comparable um, in its quality to uh, the Stewart Valley in the north of Essex. Um, and here you can see a fairly typical landscape view of the Chama Valley. Um, the wooded hills on the northern side, uh, scattered farmsteads, the line of the river marked by the um, very typical tricky back willows. And of course, the river is at the heart of the landscape. Uh, whilst I've said that it's um, of comparable quality to the uh, Stewart Valley in the north of the county, of course, it's nowhere near as well known as the Stewart. The Stewart has been famous and prominent through its long association with the uh, paintings of John Constable. And hitherto, the Stewart Valley has lacked any association with uh, such a comparable cultural figure. Uh, but nowadays, um, it's increasingly seen as the landscape of one of the greatest nature and landscape writers of the 20th century, J.A. Baker, who lived and worked in Chelmsford all his life and uh, whose work was centered very much on the valley. And the 50th anniversary of the um, public, first publication of his great work, The Peregrine, uh, provided an opportunity to explore that. And, resulted in the publication of the first major uh, biography of uh, Baker. The, the Chilmer Valley is really much, very much at the heart of his work. And in fact, the um, editor of uh, his collected works, published to mark the anniversary of the publication of the Peregrine, um, has said that uh, the Chama Valley is very much Baker country. Uh, the Peregrine and the Hill of Summer describe a roughly rectangular patch of Essex, which includes the Chama Valley from the eastern edge of Chelmsford as far west as Maldon and the confluence of the Chama and Blackwater rivers. At its heart lies Danbury Hill with its glorious uh, ancient woodlands. And John Fanshaw, in his introduction to the Baker's Diaries, notes that the diaries in the extant form mention over 500 place names, and his focus was consistently the Chama Valley. I think you can see that, and this is one of his, this is a copy of one of his annotated Ordnance Survey maps, um, which he used when uh, compiling the observations which he turned into his famous book, The Peregrine. And you can see his outline, Danbury Hill here, he's, he's highlighted the contours. You can see all of these. Um, Crosses here are sightings of peregrines, which he made over the years. Uh, you can see Colbert's farm in the, in the center of the slide there, Colbert's chase out through Hatfield Pebble and down through to Langford and out into the Blackwater Estuary. The publicity around um, the 50th anniversary of the peregrine led the Essex Society for Archaeology and History to uh, initiate the Chama Valley Landscape Group. Uh, and the landscape group's area of interest is marked in red on this map, and you can see the, um, the navigation running through its centre with the conservation area marked in, in green. Um, the Chalmers Valley Landscape Group uh, has representatives from many of the bodies which are interested in the, uh, the landscape, its conservation and management, uh, the local authorities, city council, Braintree District Council, many of the parish councils, 
your own trust, uh, Essex Waterways, the Essex Wildlife Trust, the National Trust and others. The purpose of the CBLG, uh, as it says on the screen here, is to assist its members in working together to develop enhanced understanding, conservation and management of the Chamber Valley landscape. And its aims are threefold, to encourage conservation, management and enhancement of the Valley's natural and historic environment, to help maintain, explain and develop the cultural significance of the Valley's, significance of the Valley's landscape, to help manage and facilitate public engagement with the Valley landscape with the longer term overall aim of achieving some kind of designated status for its landscape. And I think if we just flip back to that map there, you can see that why that would be useful to have a broader designation. You can see the, the existing conservation zone, which is very long indeed, um, one of the longest in the country and maybe even the longest conservation uh, area uh, in, in England, but very narrow, really just the, the bottom of the valley floodplain. So the wider area would actually benefit from some uh, wider designation. So the second part of my talk, I'm just going to take you through some of the key aspects of the historic landscape of uh, the Chama Valley. And that uh, uh, is perhaps no surprise since I am an archaeologist by trade and this is really my uh, area of expertise. I suppose the most obvious uh, aspect of the historic environment uh, of the Chama Valley to most people are the historic buildings, the timber frame buildings which um, uh, are scattered throughout the valley. And here we can see one in the centre here, it's Talbot's Farm, it's one of a number of medieval manorial sites which exist in the valley, a very typical valley landscape with cricket bag willows in the foreground here. Uh, and I chose to show this uh, rather distant view of the timber frame building at Talbot's. Um, because obviously the buildings themselves are of a great uh, intrinsic interest, but also important is their setting within the valley landscape. And this is very typical when you've got the Colbert's farm here, another group of buildings in the background there, and some agricultural buildings out to one side. And that dispersed pattern of settlement has been characteristic of the valley landscape, certainly since the medieval period. And indeed, it increasingly appears that it has been that, that uh, really since what we would recognize as a farming landscape came into being during the Neolithic and Bronze Age uh, four to 6,000 years ago. Uh, and the next aspect of the, the historic built environment, which is probably very commonly recognized, are um, historic industrial buildings, like the mill we're in today, um, Sanford Mill, um, this is the pumping station at Langford, seen here in its operational heyday. Now, of course, the Museum of Power. And of course, the industrial uh, structures of the Blackwater and Chalmers Canal itself. And this is, of course, Paper Mill Lock. And you can see the, um, the lock itself with the brick built bargeman's bothy behind. And I think this uh, shot gives you a clear indication that um, Paper Mill Lock is now. Uh, part of probably the one of the greatest industries of the late 20th and early 21st century, which is, of course, leisure and entertainment. By far the most striking, I think, and certainly the oldest aspect of the historic buildings within the Chama Valley are, of course, the churches, which range from this uh, very familiar and very uh, picturesque small structure at Alting, right by the river, to large, I've gone the wrong way, excuse me, to large complex structures like this one at Boreham, uh, where the oldest visible part of the building uh, dates back over a thousand years into the later Saxon period. And in any given parish, if you look for the uh, oldest visible sign of human activity next to the parish church, it's likely to be, you've gone the wrong way again, we are getting used to it, likely to be these hedges. Now, obviously, we tend to think of hedges as being natural features, not surprisingly, really, since they're made of trees and shrubs and are, of course, of great importance for the natural environment and biodiversity. But such a thing cannot exist in nature. They are um, human constructions created for very particular social and economic reasons, maintained, valued or not indeed maintained for similar social and economic reasons. And this is one of the hedges, many hedges which exist throughout the valley. It's a particularly interesting one, in fact. Um, 
despite the predominance of suckering elm and sloe, it's actually quite a species rich uh, hedge, which um, is often an indication of an ancient hedge. It's actually the hedge which you can see there in the full bloom of a black form winter. Uh, and contained within it, within that uh, foliage, is a very prominent hedge bank, which as it runs north down into the valley of a small stream there, becomes progressively uh, wider and higher. So the time it reaches the, uh, the stream edge, it's uh, almost two metres high and many metres broad. It's very likely the remains of a medieval mill dam. And you can see, I think, this declivity in the field here, that slightly unnatural dip there, is almost certainly the remains of a, the site of the former uh, medieval mill pond. Similarly, the woodlands, which we often think of as primarily natural, are in fact uh, the creation of human activity, managed and uh, uh, constrained in many ways by um, people over many hundreds of years. And this is one of the many woods which exist on the, particularly on the Danbury and Little Baddow Ridge, seen here with the bluebells in full flower. And this shows those woods uh, as they were in the, depicted on the Chapman Andre map of 1777. You can see uh, the woodland scattered around there. And these woods and attendant pastures were often, uh, they, were, they were of great economic value and they were often divided up um, between quite distant parishes. Point to note here, or two, two or three points to note really, this is the, the core of what is now um, that complex of woodland uh, which is managed by uh, the Wildlife Trust and the National Trust, uh, now almost completely wooded. Here you can see it's largely, in 1777, largely open heathland and common ground. Particularly striking, I think, is um, uh, Lingwood Common here, here marked as Lingard Common. Now, of course, whilst there are areas of open space there, it's almost completely secondary woodland. Lingard, Lingwood, Lingwood has moved out and colonised the uh, former open ground. And that is, again, um, the result of human activity, or in this case, inactivity the result of the reduction in what had formerly been key uh, grazing land and the grazing cease so the, the secondary woodland can develop. Uh, and whilst this is on the screen, I think it does show you really rather well the dispersed pattern of um, settlement within the valley, which is still largely present. Obviously now we have quite a large um, nucleated settlement at Danbury, another at Boreham, the um, Sort of ribbon development that runs down the ridge and North Hill and Little, Little Baddow. But by and large, uh, the buildings which you see here scattered about the valley are still that dispersed pattern of settlement. You see Colbert's Farm, which we saw earlier on in that slide, the um, church hall complex in Little Baddow, uh, and various other farms and buildings um, scattered throughout. So there's the church at Alting, which we also saw scattered throughout the, uh, the valley there. And uh, Typically, as I mentioned, the importance of the um, industrial settings, all these mills, paper mill, home mill, uh, the channel backbone, the navigation, obviously key to that. The last, I suppose, really key aspect of the uh, historic landscape are um, the valley bottom pastures, which were once extraordinarily important to the economy of the area. Uh, now, of course, largely ploughed up. Some do survive, but they've largely been converted to arable. These, again, were um, often divided up into separate strips, which are farmed by often quite distant farms. And that's a form of landholding, which survived uh, right down into the middle of the last century, the middle of the 20th century. And this is one of the larger uh, former meadows in the valley. This is Risley Mead, uh, seen in the winter when it floods. We're standing at its northern edge and the river is about half a kilometre away where the cricket bat willows are sown, marking the line of the, the river there. It's difficult to know um, how old this form of land is, but it's certainly been around throughout the medieval period, highly likely to have been uh, there during the Saxon period. And there are indications indeed that it may even be older than that. But old as these features are, uh, the the buildings and the, the landscape features such as hedges, uh, meadows and woods. There are even older uh, landscapes preserved um, 
beneath and within the, uh, the existing landscape we see today. And they can often be seen as crop marks from the air. Here we can see a complex of crop marks at uh, Wood and Walter. You can see the dark lines here of the remains of round barrows, of farmstead enclosures, of rectilinear enclosures, and trackways showing as uh, dark marks in the ripening corn uh, when photographed from the air. And this shows you a transcription of those crop marks um, and also shows you the excavated areas of some trial excavations which were opened up 50 years ago actually in the 1970s to try and ascertain something of the history of this uh, uh, crop mark landscape. Uh, and this slide gives you an indication of its development from Bronze Age barrows here through the Iron Age and into the Roman period. You can see developing enclosures, farmstead enclosures, the trackways, which I pointed out earlier on, and the original barrows up in the top left here. Now, um, there is indeed a remarkable uh, complex archaeology of the Neolithic and Bronze Age, a period when uh, farming was first introduced into this country and when the, the landscape, which we know today, began to be constructed. Um, I'm not intending to talk you through the archaeological evidence for that, but I do want to conclude by showing you one particular object, which is this uh, remarkable, very fine, um, bifacially flaked uh, flint dagger blade. At least I hope you can see it. It's unfortunately a dark blade on a dark background, the blade of the flint up there. It was found 100 years ago. Um, when the works for uh, the Langford pumping station were being undertaken. Uh, and it was um, an object which would have been extraordinarily uh, um, would have been a very rich and difficult thing to get hold of, the kind of thing which um, a prominent individual would have had. Uh, the sort of thing that uh, some of you may have heard of the uh, gold diadem which was found um, in the Chelmer Valley at Little Baddo a couple of years ago and is now on display in Chelmsford Museum. This flint dagger and that object date from around about the same time, so sometime before 2000 BC, so we're talking over 4,000 years ago. Uh, and they would have been the kind of possessions which a chap like this uh, may have had. You can see he's got his gold diadem on his head there, a dagger in his belt. This is in fact a, a, a copper dagger, but I mean the other alternative was to have these finely crafted um, flint daggers. Uh, that was a, something which a prominent individual would have had, um, say 2300 BC. Uh, and it was, when it was found, it was given what was then a very valuable and unusual um, handle made of Bakelite. Uh, and uh, it was given a, an inscribed silver plate and presented to another important person, the um, director of the water company and is now housed in South End Museum. It's a complex uh, cultural artifact which has been made and reused and reused over the millennia. And in fact, it's perhaps um, a symbol really of the valley landscape itself, which again is a, a cultural construction in the sense of the word which uh, anthropologists and archeologists like myself use it. It's been made, shaped, valued by people over millennia uh, and has been handed down to us so that we can uh, do our share of uh, conserving, managing it and using that landscape. And it's really the aim of the Chelmer Valley Landscape Group to take this ancient cultural landscape, uh, recognise it as the literary landscape of J.A. Baker and make people aware that that doesn't just survive in his books, but has a real physical presence in the landscape today and use that understanding to try and help uh, and serve and preserve it uh, for future generations. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. Um, yeah, I suggest we sort of carry on then, shall we, rather than uh, break at this point, because we've got you know, plenty of time. So Keep up the momentum. Exactly. <laughs> so questions, points of view, observations. I, want, I didn't want to interrupt you. I wanted to know where a couple of those previous photos were taken, especially the hedge that you were. Yeah, yeah, to yeah, yeah. But you know, uh, well, if you um, actually, I can point to that. If I go back to the Chapman Laundry, oh dear, 
I can point out where it is. There's a footpath that runs south Thanks, from Dad. Boreham Church, <laughs> and it comes down here, yeah. and it hits, this is not quite accurate, this bit of the stream. The stream comes down there, and it bends round, and then it goes down to Risley Mead, and it's this piece, I think this is this page here, comes down to what's known as the Bulls Lodge Brook, sometimes known as the Boreham Brook. Uh, so it's just south of Boreham Church. Yeah, yeah. Well, the next time you do that, next time you do that, if you just no. if, when you reach when you reach the turning, you turn yeah. left. If you just look I along the stream, yeah, there's a big bank. And yeah. in the winter, when the, the foliage isn't there, you can see that getting to come down here. It gets it's starts about two minutes, and it gets narrower and narrower and slower and lower, but it pushes up just about a meter high. Uh, so that's the mm -hmm. that's the medieval look of it. It was potentially to do with the mill or... Oh, I think it's Penny, it's a medieval mill then. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fascinating, thank yeah. you. Well, that's my question, so... <laughs> <laughs> over to you guys. Can I just be reminded of what year that map was, please? 1777. So that predates mm -hmm. it? It does. No, it doesn't, does it? So, yes, it does, yeah, of course it does. Yeah. Well, the mills are still there. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Could you remind me what year or how long ago the dagger was found? A hundred years ago. It was found when the, the pumping station was being built. Right. In the 20s. Yeah, 1928. Yeah. Yes. It was slightly earlier than that. I think it might have been the preliminary work. All right. Yeah, more yes, you are talking about the previous uh, yeah. director. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's probably better than his days. Uh, I don't know. Be the France or his father, Gordon? That I can tell. I'm just curious. I worked there for 38 oh, years. Oh, did you? Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well done. Oh, yeah, I suspect it wasn't lost. <laughs> I suspect it was well, probably what was working that found it. They probably didn't notice the context it was in. It was almost certainly a threat. Mm. And of course, because it's acid gravel there, you didn't see the participants. It's not the kind of thing you lose. Sure. Yeah, almost certainly. I don't know if anyone's looking at that. They're almost always uh, out in burials. But it wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have been in someone, but, you know, I don't think. <laughs> I don't think anyone's ever found anybody with the remains of those people. There's quite a lot of skeletons from an earlier periods where you've got the uh, the broken tips of flint arrows. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, I'm, and then also in the later periods where you've got bronze spears, there are occasionally found. I don't think there's ever, there's not a single instance, as far as I'm aware, of a flint dagger in someone's no. body. No. <laughs> Sorry, I've yeah. ruined it. Golf in, see you. Know. But of course, <laughs> you know, it doesn't mean to say it wasn't used that way because you've actually got to hit someone's bone and then break it. Yeah. So, yeah, otherwise, you've got to put it against the soft tissue, which is what it's designed to do. Yeah. But, uh, not going to say that. Mm -hmm. Did you have a question, Emmy? Well, yes. Oh, yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, I was just going to ask, is there an ongoing program for the archaeology of the area, or is it only just triggered if someone trips over a very nice exit? <laughs> um, well, yes and no, I think. There's, it's quite a complicated answer, unfortunately. And I think the perhaps the simplest and um, the most important bit of the answer is to say that... Uh, a lot of the archaeological field work is done really and has been done in this county and across the whole of England for the last, well, nearly 50 years now, has been uh, directly linked to the planning process. So it's uh, mm. finding out what might be affected by um, planning applications, if the planning applications are then granted, excavation work carried out in advance of that. Uh, and a lot of that work has been done all the way along the valley, but particularly, of course, in the Springfield area uh, and in the area to the immediate um, west of Malden and Elms Farms. So a lot of work's done there. Uh, a lot of um, research work is an ongoing program of aerial photography goes on. Um, there are chance finds. Uh, I actually wrote up with my colleague David Buckley. Um, 30 odd years ago now, uh, a Lake Bronze Age hall, which was found in the back garden of a gentleman who was having his patio relayed in uh, Plantation Road in, in Bourne. And then there are very active um, local societies, particularly the modern archaeological group, who carry out uh, 
research um, throughout the valley. They've done a lot of work at uh, Beedi Abbey, and they've also done some work on some earthworks in some of the woods on the Little Paddo Ridge. So yeah, a lot of it goes on, um, not being driven by the planning process, but all sorts of other things as well. And the best place to find out about it is to rush out and join the Essex Society for Archaeology and History, who of course initiated the Chelmsford Valley Landscape Group and are always wishing to uh, um, get some new members. So uh, check out their website. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I, I, I want to go with an easy one, and then I want to go with what might become a more interesting oh. one. So I've got two to go with it. I'm interesting, not hard. Well, let's see, because yeah. uh, it involves Matthew there. So oh. I didn't recognise you when you came in, so apologies for not uh, welcoming more than I did. Um, so my, my easy one was, I'm surprised, given the amount of flooding that goes on, and just over the past few days, I've yeah. seen yeah. flooding, mm -hmm. that, for instance, Alting Church is there. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are a number of properties right on, right, right beside the river, right beside the navigation. Yeah. Said, well, why did they build it there when it flooded so much? Yeah. Why did they build an Alting Church just there? Yeah, I don't. Does Alting Church flood very much though? I mean, I think Alting Wood does. Well, the, the, the grounds of Alting Wood do, but the building itself very rarely. And there's no, really? there's, and that's flat right across the field. It's there. not. As, it does, but that's what if you look at if you look at rain birds, which is here. This floods tremendously through here, but not yeah. there. It's just that little bit higher. Okay. It doesn't take much, just okay. a little meter or so. So yeah. normally people have built things just above. So they, you know, they might occasionally get flooded, but I, well, I've been walking past running the top and on for the last 30 years, never seen it flood. Okay. Yeah. And someone who I was wishing, wish I was here tonight, when we go down past Alton Church on one of the trim boats, tells people that there's um, an underground chamber that goes from Alton Church down towards where the Actually, where the Langford water intake uh, outlet comes, where the sewage yeah. comes out there. So, is there any truth in that? That wasn't a second well, difficult flood. question, by the way. Yeah, that was flood. But it, <laughs> yeah, no, it doesn't seem that you would, you would have a good no, underground I mean, thing I don't mean to be like disrespectful, that. But, but almost every church has some kind of underground passage associated with it. We're often said to run to the hall. Uh, I don't know that anyone has ever found uh, okay. any of these are actually true. Okay. Some of them may be uh, stories resulting from people discovering uh, on the larger halls um, Tudor sewers and drains. Right. Which are the, there's ones at Lee's Hall, you know, uh, um, uh, up at uh, Little Lee's, there's a, oh, yeah. a really fine um, Tudor mansion. Uh, Richard Richards, you know, the Warwick's uh, chief residence. Uh, and they're enormous, these two brick drains. Um, you know, well, they are drains, not And if you didn't know what they were, you <laughs> might think, oh, it's under the passage. Yeah, yeah, it's not, it's a burn. Right. Uh, I don't know, I, I'm pretty certain they're obvious stories. Right. So now onto the more sort of political, maybe one. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the threats to the valley development. Yeah. Matthew is interested in, in the enhancement of the valley, but also, you know, it, this is the Hammonds Farm area, yeah. by the way. What, what about that? I mean, how does the, the group respond to that? How much networking goes on between the group and well, landowners? Well, I should point out that the, so. um, the group was formally launched a fortnight ago. So I don't do a lot of those respond to them, but it will do in the future. Well, maybe uh, this is the first link yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Maybe Matthew was in at the very beginning here. In a few yeah, weeks, uh, he's thrown an interest. And the other interesting complexity about it, because it consists of representatives on the local authorities of the parishes. So it has to take a sort of a, a like a considered with a general view. I will say that there's a it's been um, in formation for some time uh, and the group did put in uh, a comment about the consultation to the five-year revision of the Chelsea local plan. And I think that there were or five options, and it took a very considered view, saying this is good and that's bad, and this is not so good, at each of those options. Um, it was most opposed to the large scale development of the Hammond's farm, because I think of the impact it's likely to have on the, uh, the child But it takes a pretty considered approach. It doesn't tend to come out and say, oh, we're against this, it's terrible. It, you know, explains why it comes easy. Yeah. And, uh, and that uh, response will, of course, be available on the, uh, the City Council's website. Yeah. 
But there was, I mean, there were a number of challenges from Chumps of Dan out there in terms of Manor Farm and uh, they yeah, down by yeah. foxes and yeah. very yeah. so on. Oh, yeah, there are. There, there is full of challenges. I mean, it, you know, and the, indeed, you know, the, the tremendous use that's uh, developed in the valley since the pandemic, really. I mean, the, the pressure exactly. people are using. Yeah. Well, I'm mean, obviously more people use it, more than people appreciate it. But I mean, there, there is a sort of, um, you can get into a disaster mode. But it's all terrible. It's all going to be catastrophe. But I think all of these things can be thought through, talked through, worked out what the impacts are, see what the, the qualities of the landscape are, and there, there's generally a way through these things. And of course, landscapes are very big. You know, it's not, not huge, but the distance between Chelmsford and Malvern is quite a long way on a width to it. So it's really a question of seeing, you know, what's, uh, what's appropriate and what have you done. Now, I, I find that response really interesting mm. because you know, there was a panic at paper mill, wasn't there? There were too many people going to paper mill, yeah, yeah, yeah. they're parking yeah, on the yellow yeah, lines, yeah. so we had to enforce this <laughs> and get rid of them yeah, and so on. Yeah. Yeah. And my personal view, and it's not so much an altruist point of view, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Oh, good, you know, people are coming down here, let's do something about the parking rather than just ban people from parking there. I mean, the sort of oiks that go down there are not terribly keen on many of them because, you know, they're not, um, you know, not entirely respectable of, uh, of, of the landscape in many ways. Don't quote me, oh gosh, I've been on film saying this now. <laughs> but, uh, but I mean, that's a challenge, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. You know, local hotspots. Yeah, you know, it is. I mean, so it's, a, it's a challenge to get, to get people there and let them enjoy the landscape and do what they want to do, uh, but also recognise that there are impacts. You know, there's the simple impact of parking, but then, you know, there are, you look at the other place in the park, which is where the, uh, the Black Bridge, where the road goes across from the Little Bado to the Forum. Oh, yeah. So that's a conservation verge there. Yeah. And because yeah. that's a that's people parking. That's a place. Yeah. And people, uh, that, that's the sort of thing you need to under, try and get people to understand. But that isn't just a piece of grass. That's an important part of the natural environment of the valley. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a tricky thing. But can you get people to understand? Well, I don't see why not. I don't know if you listened to the Today program at all, but there was um, an Argentinian chap there this morning. I did hear that. Managing, yes. yeah. Yep. Managing a beach, which is obviously yeah, a very popular this, beach. This for penguins, wasn't it? Yeah, for dog them. walkers and people having barbecues and you know walking on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, and there are twelve penguins left, and now I've got two thousand. That's right. But it sounded like it was quite a quite an interesting debate with the local people. But it did actually work in the end. So it can be done. Not yeah. an easy thing. But that, that did involve getting the people off the beach and <laughs> it away did, from the beach. It did, absolutely. It's it's a different, exactly. But I mean, that's a different. That's a, but it, what I'm saying is, it's the same kind of thing. You've got a, a, a conflict between, in that case, nature conservation and people using it. And the, and the situation there was they like, were removed. I don't know how they, they manage it yeah. in the longer term. But that obviously isn't the case at Pagan Mill Lock or at um, or the Black Bridge. But it does mean to show that even the most complex and seemingly dire situations have uh, got a way through. And that's so, positive. Well, uh, I don't want to get too carried away, but um, Emmanuel Kant, you know, the uh, sage of Königsberg, yeah. really good pure reason all that. Uh, he, um, I think, not unreasonably uh, established to his own satisfaction that hope is a moral duty. So it's very easy to get pessimistic. I think we all do get pessimistic. Uh, and depressed, but it's worth just hanging on to the hopeful side of things. Right. There's a message to take away, isn't it? Hope is a moral duty. Uh, <laughs> Not me, it's a you. No, no, but I'm happy <laughs> for you to pass on to yeah. me. Pass on. Matthew, do you want to come back on anything? Yeah, no, to do and with... if I may, yeah. yeah. So, so um, I suppose, you know, we're, we're a significant landowner at Hamilton, mm. and, yeah. and we have five kilometres of the waterway mm. that we can work with out from. Do the bado all the way down to Sanford Bill. Yes. Uh, and there's an opportunity for us, yeah. uh, and also an opportunity for the group and yes. the trust, yeah. because you know there is the ability to open up access to the waterway yeah. and the allocation of land, mm -hmm. which would be forming a country park yeah. in, in within the code in the overall scheme. Yeah. So so what what would you expect or it's difficult to answer this, but how, how do you think the landowners should work with the local groups and, and, and these people that are interested in, 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 the, uh, in this particular conservation and the way this is going to come forward? How would you recommend that we work together uh, to 
improve the area because um, that's what our intention would be. Yeah. You know, to open yeah. up the leisure, recreation, yeah. all the good yeah. things, you know, and, 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 and to make it accessible. At the moment, it's quite accessible. Yeah. Because it is farmland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but it would be. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose the thing to do then is to, you've really got to sort of see what people's concerns are, you know, the parish councils, the local conservation societies, uh, to the National Trust, the Wildlife Trust. Um, I suppose I'll ask them in the first instance. So it's, uh, they're probably not going to be too reticent in their views, I suspect, when you do ask them. But I mean, it's a, it's a, you may well find in the first instance that there is quite a lot of, oh, dear, we don't want that. But I mean, if you sort of take that on the chin and then see, well, what are the things that you know, they might really want to see there? And also perhaps get them to, from your perspective, to understand what the advantages are. Uh, that's about, I think that's the only way to do it, isn't it? To engage them in the, in the dialogue. To a large extent, you are engaged, aren't you? It's, we are engaged, but, you know, but the, 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 there's a lot of misinformation going around yeah, yeah, at the yeah, moment yeah, in yeah, terms of yeah. what, what we're trying to achieve and, 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 and uh, what, what other yeah. people think they're, yeah. uh, they're yeah. asking for. But yeah. I think most people's engagement has really come through the, the Chelsea City consultation, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Which is the right process. Yeah, that's right. Of course, that, yeah. That's a public yeah. process, yeah. and we're not doing anything outside yeah. of that. Yeah. But, but you know, as part of that, yeah. you know, there is a, a considerable amount of, of, of land being allocated to yeah. exactly what you're trying to yes. encourage. Yeah. 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 Uh, wetland, dry preserves, wet, yeah. you know, all, all those type of things, and access to the waterway mm -hmm. from uh, from from that from yeah. 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 So, so it, 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 it's how it's how how we can improve that yeah. and, and, yeah. and work together to, to protect what, what, what we're looking to protect. I've got a sense of that there's a whole load of potential and value here. I mean, Matthew and I have worked together, <laughs> together over one very small issue. Uh, it almost feels like it needs someone to, to grab it and do something with it rather than it sort of happening ethereally around through stuff going on, but not actually saying, okay, Matthew, this is brilliant. What can be done? You know what I mean? It, it, it's just it, perhaps the bureaucracy almost clouds the or, or diffuses the, what is fairly straightforward. Well, but it's a it's a it's a local it's a plan process, a planning process. Yeah, yeah I don't think you know what that. Anyway, but, but, it, but it, it becomes political. But but that's not that's not how we that's not how we wanted it to to kind of yeah. promote. Uh, and, and what's important to us is to is to listen. Mm. And understand uh, and respond to to those people that are are, are local. Yeah, you know, yeah. And understand yeah. what they need, yeah. what, what they want. Um, and, and I suppose it's how that's how best um, how best we can yeah, do that. Yeah. With, yeah. With, 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 with the trust as well yeah. as as the group. Yeah, we're keen to be because because it's important, you know, because there are facilities there that we yeah. Yeah. We, we think are a good idea. Yeah. Okay, in terms of opening up access to, yeah. to the waterway. There's an underpass of the A12 that we yeah. own, which is pretty, pretty dotty at the moment. And yeah. And improve yeah. that and yeah. make that more of a destination and so on. Yeah. And we go across the A12 and, and all the way down to Stanford as well. So, yeah. so there's, yeah. you know, we do link through yeah. to what will be the country park uh, in East Johnson. Yes. It's been designated. So there is a continuous ribbon all the way through. Yeah. The, the river all the way from the city centre through yeah and um, to uh, to to at least um Little Ballet, which is going to be open uh, as a as a country park yeah so yeah. sorry if this, this is going into detail as to what yeah what we're thinking but yeah. certainly there there seems to be something there yeah. with which which uh, will benefit yeah um, what you're trying to do. So yeah that's a good point. Right? Thank you, thank you both for that. Um, I think I've taken up quite a lot of time with my stuff, so, you know. <laughs> Anything else? I was intrigued that um, you've focused on that area, and I guess it's because of the pair of rims. I don't know, but I mean, it struck me that this valley goes on up beyond Chelmsford. It does, I think, I think yeah. that's right. And also, of course, there's the, the Black River Street. But I think uh, the trouble with um, valley landscapes, in the sense that you end up looking at some um, River catchment, and then you've got half of central Essex, and it becomes yeah. you know, unmanageable. There is, I think, it, what it inspired the 
as you started your article in history to initiate the Channel Railway landscape, it was indeed the recognition that um, because Baker's work is now well, not only nationally here, but internationally here, it's very much his literary landscape that suggests as you know, the Stuart Valley has become constable country. There is a real opportunity to focus attention on that classic bit of the landscape which he explored between Chompsford and Malden. And you're right, of course, that the river allows to go much further up. But because of the way Chompsford is situated, it does fall quite neatly into those two blocks, that which is uh, east of Chompsford and that which is the north and west. And I think it's, it's sensible to concentrate on the that bit of the valley because it, you know, it fits in with uh, really a, a key um, cultural understanding of what's there. And it can link with what is already going on in the Northwest North West. You have to draw a line somewhere. I think that fits quite neatly as an area both for study and for conservation. I talk about drawing lines. So you showed early on that. that yeah, it's not, particularly, it's not particularly hard and fast, but you have to have some. You know, when people say, well, what's the area of interest in you? <coughs> yeah, that's it, really. And well, that's, uh, yeah. That's, oh, that's no, I was particularly excited to see it because it, it emphasized <coughs> Danbury Hill. It, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. The way the well, I think, drawn exactly. There. And I think that's for two reasons, well, for several reasons. One is you know, the sheer uh, scale of um, conservation land ownership out there with you know, the country park, the National Trust holdings, the Wildlife Trust holdings. The realisation that it, you know, it's a key landscape and natural environment. Also, that it's a, um, a critical aspect of the historical model, what I'm saying about that complex uh, of land and all of the extraordinary range of earthworks that exist in, in the land landworks. But also because it uh, is a prominent part of uh, Baker's literary landscape. So, although, in fact, it, it, it actually takes you. It, it, Strictly in geographical terms, out of the valley because we include the um, south side of the hills and we're looking down to the other side of the hills. Um, it's logical to have that down there. And as you know, the quote I gave from uh, the introduction to the diamonds, um, his work was focused very much on the channel valley with Andrew Hill as its as its point. Yeah. So, yeah, it's part of the, part of the So, what would be the epitome of designation? Well, I mean, it, it's. I, it's quite complicated, really, but I mean, I think you you might want to look, to look in the long term to something like uh, an AOMB, maybe. Right. Uh, we're in the same way with Stuart Valley as I am. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that would probably be the, uh, the top scale of designation. There'll be other things sort of on the way to that or the lower end. I don't know if we've pitched our, uh, uh, pitched on one particular thing. Like that, but that's uh, and who, who awards that designation? How's that? Natural England. Oh, right. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't know the process, but it's Natural England or England Charter. And I would imagine it's a bit like, uh, which I do understand a bit more about, which is in the historical world, if you look, want to um, uh, schedule something as an ancient monument, it's actually historic England that does that. But critically, uh, what they do is they say, oh, yes, that should be scheduled. But, it's a recommendation to the minister. I mean, that's just the same. Oh, okay. It's yeah. government, that's the same. Right. And I imagine it's the same with, uh, with um, landscape and natural environment designation. Okay. Thank you. Well, that's guesswork. It's not actually, <laughs> not actually gospel. Oh, it's on the recording now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> it's there. Yeah. Anything further? Uh, yeah, you've got yeah, another yeah, yeah, yeah. You talk about landscape, and to me, landscape includes trees and so on. Mm. And you know, I've noticed along the Chelmer mm -hmm. over the years, there's, a, there's plenty of willows there, yeah. but the, I wouldn't call them natural, alder trees and <laughs> yes. ash trees yeah. and, and oak trees now disappearing on the, along the river. Yeah. They're, they're, aren't, they're dying or falling down. Yeah. Or the only thing that seems to be replaced is willows. Well, willows are a course of crop. Yeah, right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. But I mean, it just seems to me that the outlook of the river is changing. Well, I don't know actually. I, I'm not sure I necessarily agree with that. I mean, I first got to know this part of the world, uh, I suppose, in the, the mid 60s when I was a child. And I've got to know it really very well indeed for the last 35 years. And I don't think that that has changed that much in terms of the trees. Obviously, we've got a problem there with ash plants. But if you go, you know, if you just walk um, back towards uh, 
the Black Bridge from um, Agamemnon Log. You quite quickly come across that rather fine bit of all the coal woodland there, that is where the, the new bit of bridges across. So I think mm -hmm. uh, it's, it, it's not necessarily that things aren't changing, but a lot of it is something which is, you know, like Ash Dieback, which is something which is bigger than the valley. I think Alder seems to be flourishing really in the world. Well, I'm, I'm down this site a bit between Faith and Mill and Hallow Mill, really. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. You know, Over the years, I've got yeah. quite a yeah. number of fairly large Alder trees disappear. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's ash trees yeah. that are disappearing yeah. as well. But, um, yeah, well, ash trees will do, won't they? Yeah, yeah. Well, they will. Yeah. 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 But it, I mean, it just seemed to me that yeah. they're looking at different species of, say, ash tree, yeah. for instance, which is yeah. dying back resistant. That's right. Um, yeah. I didn't know who would be in a position to maybe put some of these new these new versions in. You know. um, yeah, well, I suppose uh, I mean, there are all sorts of planting schemes. You know, the, you can see. Um, I think the some of the uh, conservation schemes which farmers use. Um, I imagine that the planting advice will eventually come through. There, I don't think we're at the stage yet where we can say that this particular variety of ash is you know, ready for. Uh, planting will be more resistant to ash type. I mean, there will be later on. I, I just wondered, Mike, if you're going to push up a bit further and say, well, the Woodland Trust is sort of giving away saplings and so on to groups like ourselves, and maybe get out there and do some. Well, the county council, you know, the county council is doing just that. Right. Go on their website, you can get free trees. Right. Yeah. Snap up the offer whilst it's still there. Well, we, better, we better ask Matthew for a bit of his yeah. land down there. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we we, 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 we plant like, uh, yeah, 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 of course. Sure we, but we yeah. 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 And you don't want anything else down there. Well, I think that um, <laughs> it's an interesting proposition, really. But I think the it would be a great shame to uh, lose the. Um, cricket back below because they're absolutely essential for the landscape. They're really, really typical. They're really, really typical, aren't they? And of course, you know, it's important, uh, yeah. important local industry. So, uh, yeah, they're, um, they're a key part of the landscape. Yeah. 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 <laughs> You're talking to the guy who's got two coracles. <laughs> no, uh, the nearest I think of you is the uh, down the Crouch Estuary, the Gluden Paddle, which is a complete one and a half meters long, uh, later Bronzo's Paddle, now in the National Maritime Museum. Um, that's the, uh, the nearest, I think, uh, archaeological. Yeah. There's all sorts of um, boats of different periods from the Lee, but not round here. No. Oh, yeah. This is the thought. Um, can, can we just feed the Susan in at that point? You know, <laughs> the historic vessels on the historic vessels register, you know, yeah. and uh, hopefully to come back. Yeah, sorry, when I, I tend to think of these things because of my special museum and the music of Bronzo. Yeah. I tend to think of really ancient. You know, I, I, suppose I, I, I respect the fact you did. Yeah, I was yeah. a bit cheeky in putting that yeah, way, yeah. just because we've got such an interest in yeah, yeah, the solution and getting it back onto the navigation. Okay, I think if there's nothing else pressing, I'm going to declare this the end of uh, our meeting, apart from the refreshments. You've got to have refreshments tonight because Susan's here, she's come specially to prepare. <laughs> I've made the journey all the way to Tesco's to uh, get all the raw materials. So, can we thank Nigel again very much for? Well, I find that's a good question.